Thank you all so much for being here, and we are excited about our panel, um, on the breakout panel session on RTI implementation and related research. We have six panelists today who will present their research related to mathematics and tiered supports. The order of the presentation is by the intensity of instruction, starting with tiers one and two with Dr. Barbara Doherty and ending with Rebecca Edmonds and Kathleen Fenestiel talking, discussing tier three intensity of instruction. I will first briefly introduce our panelists and each will present for approximately 10 minutes, followed by a break for discussion questions following the second and the last presentation for about seven or eight minutes. Our first panelist, Dr. Barbara Doherty, is the director for, of the Curriculum Research and Development Group at the University of Hawaii. Barb is a past member of the National Council of Teachers Mathematics Board of Directors and is past chair of the NCTM Research Committee. Barb is co-author of the Conceptual Assessments for Progress Monitoring of Students in Attaining Algebraic Reasoning Skills and Concepts on Developing Algebra Models for Middle School and High School Students. So we have Barbara. And um, we'll start with Barbara. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to talk with you today about mathematics and students who struggle. So I'm gonna be like Karen, and I'm gonna say straight up, I'm gonna say some things that are probably gonna go against everything we've ever thought we knew, including myself. Uh, so I've disagreed with myself several times during this research work. Um, the, way, the thing that I'm gonna talk about today involves two projects, so I'm gonna give a brief overview of those, and then I'm going to talk not so much about the way in which those projects were laid out, but more about the lessons that we've learned from those because I think that's where it's much more significant in terms of the work. So the two projects that are informing the work were, were both funded by IES. This particular project is with Diane Bryant, who was the PI and Brian Bryant and myself as co-PIs, where we developed intervention modules for tier two to be used in middle school to prepare students for algebra. I'll just say that this particular project, uh, I came in as a naive mathematics educator who said to Diane the very first day, let's just be clear, we're going to do all discourse-based instruction. And Diane looked at me and said, okay. And we moved from there. And when I found out that that has to be tempered a tad bit. The second project is one where Ann Fagan is the PI. I'm the co-PI as the math person. Again, came in very naive as a mathematics educator, thinking that it's very easy to construct conceptual measures because I've been very critical of special educators who have developed only skill-based tools to determine whether or not students are achieving at the appropriate level. That myth that I had about how easy it was to develop conceptual measures was dispelled within the first year of our project where we started with all open-ended items and realize very quickly that it's very difficult for reliability, but beyond that, we also learned that many students are not able to express themselves conceptually. So we had a lot of impact from that. And then when we went into classrooms, we also found out that most of the classrooms still today, even after all the work we've done in math education, are still primarily focused in developing skill. So those two projects are going to inform the kinds of things that I talk about. What's really interesting about both projects is that we started with some pretty basic foundations about what are some mathematical beliefs that we could buy into. I think it's really important to think about mathematics as more than performing procedures because we see a lot of kids who can do procedures but then when faced with a non-routine problem or a problem where something is changed up quite slightly, you see students who are not able to think about the mathematics in a different way. We also wanted to be sure that any of the mathematics we did involved a lot of languaging because it's important for kids to hear their thinking. And it's great when you hear kids in the classroom say things like, I'm disagreeing with myself because as they start to explain and they hear their reasoning, they're often confronted with something that once they hear it out loud, it really doesn't sound quite right. We also believe that some topics can be taught concurrently rather than sequentially. 
And that's critical because a lot of times what happens is we break down the mathematical content to such small pieces that kids aren't even able to figure out how does that math even fit together. So for example, teaching addition and subtraction together makes a lot of sense instead of teaching first addition and then teaching subtraction. We also believe that understanding quantitative relationships is fundamental to all of mathematics. When students cannot ferret out quantitative relationships, that presents a big issue. And then, of course, developing generalizations feeds into the articles that Karen mentioned that we've co-authored, where we talk about what are generalizations that can hold true. And those generalizations, if you remember her diagram with the skimp where there were connections, those are the ways in which kids make the connections. So those were the premises that we started with. Lessons learned. The first thing that we learned is that the I do, we do, you do approach is problematic. It's problematic because students are watchers of the mathematics and not doers within the mathematics. And I know that that's a prevalent way of thinking about explicit instruction, but we had to ask ourselves in both of these projects, what is it that students need to know and do in mathematics? So one of the ways that we address that is through the way in which tasks were presented. We used a questioning framework that we developed at the University of Hawaii when I first went to Hawaii way back that looked at different ways of asking questions about content that forced students to think quite differently. It was a, developed from the work that Krutetsky did way back in the, in the 70s where he focused on problem solving processes. So we used a questioning framework uh, that focused on reversibility, flexibility, and generalization questions. If you think about a very typical mathematics problem, so if we take the integer one, for example, negative three plus negative eight, very typical problem that we see students asked. Very typical. Students get really good at performing that algorithm, but they don't really think about the deeper part of that. So in both the module development and in the progress monitoring tool, we use this to change up the questions. So the three types of questions that we ask were called reversibility, flexibility, and generalization. And Diane, Brian, and I have an article, and Kat as well, that appeared in Intervention in School and Clinic that explains this more, so I'll just briefly talk about this. Reversibility questions are questions where you give students the answer and they create the problem. Those are very powerful questions because they engage every single student in the classroom. What's important about that is it helps students to create a much more flexible way of thinking about the mathematics and it keeps them engaged in the math. So if I ask instead, give me two integers whose sum is negative 11, there's an infinite number of solutions to that problem. So what happens then is a student who's not performing well can't wait for someone else to answer that question. Everybody can be held accountable and have the expectation of engaging in the instruction. Generalization questions are questions that focus on having students develop a much deeper conceptual observation of things that they notice as patterns that might be based on the structure of a problem or on the types of answers that they get as problems. And finally, the flexibility one where students are being asked to solve a problem in multiple ways or to figure out how one problem is related to another, something we always need to have them focus on but typically don't. That's led to a lot of significant changes in the mathematics because what happens in many classes is students are always said, show your work. You've seen that, right? Show your work. The problem is that most students believe that that's all about just showing the steps that you take. So rather than explaining their thinking or if I did it in a different way that I know the teacher's not gonna like, many students will just say, well, I don't really know how to do that problem. So it's always le also led to us thinking about show your thinking rather than showing your work. So a lot of these questions have a major impact on the way in which students engage in the mathematics and how they prompt us in telling us what it is that they know. So why does it matter? Think about this particular item. This is on our conceptual progress monitoring tool. Dan challenged Amy to write an equation that has a solution of three. Which equation could Amy have written? Now what's surprising is in our second semester Algebra 1 students when we presented this was one of their problems, you might just decide which one of these do you think students most likely selected. 
and it was D. What's a, not most likely, because there's only about 30%, but what's surprising about that is for second semester students in Algebra 1 to have selected that, that was quite a surprise. When we interviewed the students, what do you think they told us? The answer always comes after the equal sign, which is one of those rules that carries over much longer past elementary grades when they see significant equations where the answer always comes after. But if you notice, uh, if we take all of the different answers that they had, that's more than, it's about 75% of the incorrect answer. The other interesting thing is the way that which they thought about it. B, the students told us, oh, if the answer is three, pick the one that has the three in it the most, because that's most likely to be the right one. That's how our teacher writes those. So as we began to look at our data, we thought about our second big generalization, big lesson that we learned is it matters that students develop generalizations that don't expire. That's really, really important because students need consistency. So we also realized that it's important for students to archive their thinking and their development of generalizations. So finding out that they can archive their conjectures and move those to generalizations was a significant piece of the work that came from that. Karen already shared this particular item. So I'll just show you the rest of our data. Because when we look at the rest of our data, you quickly see that students carry over a lot of beliefs from elementary based on the rules that they've learned into the math classroom. And so changing the way in which we question is a really significant part. The other thing that we learned in our work in all of these, and again, I'm going to use the mathematical one of concrete, of concrete, semi-concrete, and abstract, is that, and this is probably the most significant thing that we learned in terms of this, is that all three of these representations should pre be presented concurrently. That concurrency of those representations allow kids to make connections across all of them, rather than presenting concrete first, or physical representations, then presenting diagrammatic, and then presenting abstract. We notice that many children, when they're, when they're in that particular progression, they can't connect the physical with the abstract when they get to that particular part. So they're not really clear how they fit together. So those are some of the major lessons that we learned. Uh, we have articles that are currently coming out, and our measures are finished. There will be posted on a website if you'd like to access any of our um, conceptual measures. I will just say, though, that the biggest thing that we've learned is that mathematics is still being focused on through skill. That skill is the most important thing. So hopefully, through some of the work, we're able to get more deeper teaching and a better way of thinking through the conceptual aspects of the mathematics. Thank you, Barbara. Um, next up, we have Madhvi Jayanti. Perfect. Oh, great. Um, she is the research director at the Instructional Research Group, and she's interested in effective instructional practices for teaching mathematics to at-risk students. Her latest project has been on a fractions intervention for low-performing students. Also, Robin Schumacher, and she's a research associate with the in Instructional Research Group research group as well, and currently manages an NSF grant investigating fractions interventions for struggling students in mathematics. She has written on topics related to fractions intervention, intensifying instruction for low performers, and analyzing error pa patterns in mathematics. Hi, everyone. So the goals for this session are twofold. I'm first going to describe our fractions intervention and draw attention to number line instruction. And then Madhvi's going to speak about our randomized control trial um, for this study. So the ideas behind this project were to bring together and merge the ideas um, about teaching mathematics across special education and mathematics education research. So on the left side, um, we have systematic instruction, explicit instruction, 
providing immediate feedback and including a lot of cumulative review, which are often hallmark traits of special education approaches in mathematics. And then out of um, the mathematics education research, there's been a lot of um, looking at explaining your thinking, um, having open-ended approaches, as Barb mentioned, and looking at multiple problem, um, multiple, excuse me, multiple solutions um, to different problems. So while explanations has been a priority among mathematics educators for a long time, it's also recently become a priority in a lot of special education research because contemporary standards are really shifting toward asking students to provide explanations for their thinking. So in that way, we were looking f um, for intervention programs that could marry the two um, ways of approaching instruction together to teach fractions concepts, procedures, and fractions word problems. And so to do that, we identified um, a program called um, TransMath. And TransMath has three different levels and covers a range of mathematics topics from grades four through eight. And what we did was we used the fractions material in that program to create a small tier two intervention for at-risk students. And some of the things that are included in the program in addition to the approaches to instruction are really a nice focus on linking, linking part whole understanding to measurement understandings. In that way, I mean with fractions, you can think of them as a part of a set or one part of one thing or multiple parts of one thing or looking at them as distance on a number line or on a ruler so a magnitude would be represented as its distance from zero. And so in intervention, we use the concrete representational abstract or semi-concrete if you, if you um, want to use that word. But the way that we included that in TransMath is the concrete or 3D representation was Cuisinier rods. Number lines were um, 2D or representational or semi-concrete, whichever term you prefer. And then equations are looking at them abstractly. And as Barb and Karen both mentioned, these were used iteratively, not necessarily sequentially. So sometimes if it made more sense to present a, con a concept first with a number line, we would do that. Or it's, and then work simultaneously with the Cuisinier rods and the number line. So really using um, all three iteratively um, when concepts were being taught. So the number line really did take a very central role and part of the reasoning behind that is that it's shown to be a really superior representation for consolidating rational numbers and whole numbers because you can represent both of them with a number line. And uh, Bob Siegler's done a lot of research on this topic. So we, we the number line accomplishes that in this program because it also can show equivalence, uh, fractions equivalencies very well. So you can look at what, that 3 fourths and 9 twelfths have the same magnitude. You can also um, work with reasoning about the relative size of magnitude. And then you can use the number line to demonstrate the four operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So I'm going to show you just a few examples from our intervention, and then I'm going to turn it over to Modvi. Um, so here are two um, examples for representing fractions on a number line and teaching students to reason about their size. The first one is using one half as a benchmark number to rationalize or reason about where four sixths might go. So four sixths is here because it is one sixth greater than three sixths, which is equivalent to one half. So they know that it's a little bit further away from the distance of zero and beyond one half. Um, also thinking about the relative size of the numerator and the denominator. So one fifth is close to zero because one is relatively small compared to five. And 10 twelfths is closer to 1 because 10 is relatively large compared to 12. So therefore, 1 fifth is less than 10 twelfths. And students, um, in, in the instruction, they're taught to really reason about what relative size means. Um, is 10 a large number or a small number? Well, it's a large number when compared to 1, but a small number when compared to 100. So really thinking about comparing of, of the two numbers in the fraction. Here is a subtraction problem with a demonstration of the Cuisinier rods next to it with the number line. 
The, the problem is at the bottom of the Cuisinier rods, 7 eighths minus 2 eighths equals 5 eighths. Um, the, the original problem is looking at 7 eighths minus 1 fourth, so it shows how 1 fourth and 2 eighths are equivalent to one another with the Cuisinier rods, and then you can um, subtract take or take away two of the rods. And then it also shows that on the number line where you would start with your um, point at 7 eighths, and since you're subtracting, you would move toward the left to end up with 5 eighths. Um, we can also use number lines and Cuisinier rods with multiplication. So the first example is showing a whole number times a fraction and how that would look with the Cuisinier rods and then the number line. And then next to that, 1 half times 2 sixths, where it, you're showing that you're taking 1 half of 2 sixths. And so that demonstration with both of those representations. So other aspects of the intervention include um, that we really provided extensive practice using the materials. We did provide frequent and immediate feedback and several opportunities for written and oral explanations. And we taught explanations as a way that we, we leveraged them through question shells that came out of Ball and Shaughnessy and through some of the data that Modvi shares. She'll um, share some of those explanations with you. Do you want it? Okay. I have been told I have. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I'll just go straight on to the RCT. So we had 205 eligible students, fifth graders, and we screened them on a fractions measure that was aligned with the contemporary state standards. A sample fell between the 18th, no, the 15th and the 38th percentile on the, on the fractions test. Uh, our sample came from three school districts from California and Tennessee. Uh, the fifth graders who were eligible were randomly assigned to treatment and control. Treatment was the transmath intervention that Robin spoke to you about, and control was basically BAU, whatever assistance was being offered by the school or by the district. So uh, tier one classroom instruction was common to both, to both the groups. Um, so what did we find? Um, basically, uh, we gave a range of measures and uh, students who received the transmath intervention did significantly better on all the measures than those who didn't. Uh, and uh, what, we, what, what I'll do is I'll talk to you a little bit about TUF 4 and TUF 5. Uh, these are the fractions measures that we developed and they were uh, validated and vetted by mathematicians. Um, and also um, they are aligned with the Common Core State Standards. So the fourth grade, the TUF 4 covers the fourth grade curriculum. The TUF 5 covers the fifth grade curriculum. Uh, I think the TUF 5 was the most difficult measure for the students. Uh, on that, they had a FX size of 0.65. Um, the test. Sorry, it, it's the FX size of the average change over classrooms or over students? Or was your unit of analysis? Unit of analysis was students. Uh, and the measures included a range of uh, type of problems, uh, word problems, uh, true or false items, uh, and also like this is one of the items I wanted to show you about. So the students had to know what the what fraction was being represented on the number line, and they had to figure out which one of those problems the sum came to that value. And of course, this is our typical procedural test. We also did measures of magnitude understanding, and so uh, the number line estimation task, zero to one, essentially what it is is this is a computer test. The students were given a number line, and they were given a bunch of fractions, and they had to estimate placement on the number line. Uh, so let's say they got two thirteens, and they would estimate it. And then they also did number line zero to two, one and five six. Okay. So again, the FX sizes on these number line uh, zero to one and zero to two. You can see. So in addition to the range of measures I just described, we also did performance assessments. That I think we did how many, Robin? Would you say about five? Five, five performance assessments throughout the year. And like this is a sample one I wanted to share with you. Um, here the students had to order the fractions from the least to the greatest, estimate their placement on the number line, and also explain their thinking. 
And I got that from Karen Karp. Um, and so this is, I think, from our control group. Uh, yes. Yes. So. Okay. And now I want to share with you a sample from the treatment group. So you can see that the student um, ordered the fractions correctly, and I'm just going to read out his explanation, his or her. I used the number line and I looked at the fractions to see their relative size, spellings, everything as the student had written. I put one eighth closer to zero because it's a unit fraction. I put half in the middle because it's a benchmark number and I put seven twelfths close to six twelfths, which is equivalent to half. I put three fourths closer to one because it is close to four fourths, but not there yet. That is why I put the fractions there. All right, uh, did I do okay on the time? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, next. We can open it up for questions for a few okay. uh, Yes, and of course I want to acknowledge our other members of our team, Russell, Karen Karp, Domino, uh, Keith Smolkowski, I don't know if he's here. Uh, I know he's at the conference, Kelly Heyman, and of course our three great assistants without whom we would have not accomplished what we set out to do. And with that, I think we are open for Q&A with Barb. So that's a great question. I, uh, for the last four years, have been teaching in a public school. And I've been teaching tier two classes and algebra. And my experience has been that you provide problems to children and they just start talking about the problems and everything's all good. And then I started teaching the tier two class and I realized that they don't know what to talk about. So the discourse-based instruction, we realized that there had to be more structure to it. So a few things that we learned is that, that one, there has to be set expectations before they go into discussion. That sounds like something that would be normal, but we realized that students don't know what's going to happen after they talk about something. Secondly, the questions that you pose to the group have to be very clear about what they talk about. And we also learned that even in middle school, you have to use sentence starters. And that's something that we started using where we give them a sentence starter before they start their discussion. And it helped them to focus on particular aspects. When we combined that with those three different types of questions, the conversation within the groups became much, much more substantive. So the question, the task itself was structured quite differently. Um, we did not give them any computational tasks to talk about, but it was always structured around one of those three questions. I think that's really critical because then that way, for the teacher, it gives the student something much deeper to think through rather than focusing on that. But the sentence starters were a huge benefit and um, letting the, we also used a technique, I forgot about this one, but I'll add this, a technique called cueing. So you know how sometimes when kids are working in groups and you're walking around and you hear them not being too productive and the teacher's instinct is to sit down and talk to the student. Uh, and what happens when, when a teacher does that is that it changes the group dynamic. So the students then begin having a conversation with the teacher rather than having the conversation within their group. So we started using a technique called cueing where the teacher uses a notepad and writes a question, a scaffolding question down or a focus question on the notepad, lays the, the post-it note on the table and walks away. And the benefit to that was that students also became more engaged and took more initiative because now they had questions they could ask each other. So that was a really big help as well. So with the 
With the explanation instruction, um, it was largely that we used a prompt structure where um, we we had them um, first think about first solve the problem, and then there was prompts of okay, think about what you did and what did you think about, and we talked about using important vocabulary, which is why also Modby had that underlined up there. So it started off as the teacher modeling a good explanation and one that wasn't as good. Um, the something that we had seen in a pilot study that from not so good explanations were the overuse of pronouns, it, that, this, and not being very specific with what they were referring, with what the students were talking about. So that was why we focused on using um, key mathematics vocabulary like a benchmark number or equivalent. And so we, we, we included that, I want to say, a written explanation was included about every four days for practicing and then the performance assessments we did five times that were where we weren't supporting their effort in giving a written explanation where it was looked at more as a as an assessment along the way to see for us to, as a formative assessment basically. I'm going to say no, uh, because I think it's important for kids to hear each other. But I've, one thing that I forgot to mention is that in our algebra project in Hawaii, we had recorded classroom discussions. And when I was doing my own personal teaching, one of the things that I found helpful was for kids to see other videos of kids doing productive discussions. And once they saw that, it they, they were kind of surprised, oh, that's what it looks like when you talk about math. Um, the, other, so the other part, though, with your question about the language piece is that I think it's important for kids to develop the language, and I think they do it through the practice of here, getting that opportunity to talk. So what we notice is, is that if the teacher also revoices or has students revoice what's being heard, they begin to develop that language, and the sentence starters were really critical in being able to do that, at least for the kids that I was working with. Well, one more question. Can you go back one slide to that performance uh, piece where people were talking? Oh. That one? Um, but it seems that there's a comparison going on at different points in time of what being compared to stuff. So I put one over A because it's closer to zero. Uh, it's, it's a unit fraction. Put a half in the middle. Seven twelfths is as close to six twelfths. It's equivalent. Do you, do you think the kids are getting a sense that uh, we are seven twelfths? The, I, so, so there's this other piece that I'm trying to sort of get at is that they've located those perfectly. Uh, and this is an exemplar. You know, I mean, you've chosen probably one. Yes. But with the same, do you think thinking through in this fashion, um, if you go back to the earlier language, like one over A, but one is, is much smaller relative to A, so that, like, assuming it's a sort of part of rendering. But that, the, that the fraction itself is one over A. It's not the one being relatively small. Can you understand me? There's a subtle difference there between the size of the fraction itself versus the comparison of the numerator to the denominator. Uh, and they're not the same thing. Uh, and I'm just wondering if, 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 you, if you get that extra piece. In that. So, so yep. I think maybe the- Half more minute. Okay, minute, yeah. I'll try to answer this. So w when you're thinking of 1 eighth, you're thinking of one of eight equal parts. And so we do also use the number line divided into fair shares to show exactly where 1 eighth would go and then move toward estimating placement on a number line. So reasoning about fractions, we're, the goal wasn't to have them place it exactly- No, 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 no Okay. Okay. But, um, but so let's say you change 
the access they made it zero to ten. Where did the kids complain? Between zero and one. I mean, so they, there is some discussion okay. about number lines that go further and what fractions go between zero and one. Yeah. And yes. in fact, they do practice that. They do practice that. Okay, thank you very much, Madhvi, Robin, and Barb. And we have Nicole Buga coming up. And I'm also going to present um, um, Rebecca and Kathleen as well. Um, first, we have Nicole, and she is currently the District Response to Intervention Coordinator for the Cumberland Public Schools in Rhode Island, and provided multi-tiered system of support, technical assistance at the Northern Rhode Island Collaborative. In this role, Nicole led five years of pilot math intervention work across five Rhode Island middle schools and will share implementation lessons learned today. Then we have uh, Dr. Rebecca Edmonds and Kathleen Fennensteel, and they're both from the American Institutes for Research. Uh, Rebecca is gonna be talking, uh, she's in DC at the AIR office where she serves as the co-director of the National Center on Intensive Intervention and as project director for an investing in innovation and improvement I3 development grant focused on intensive interventions in mathematics. And Kathleen Fennensteel is a senior researcher at the American Institute for Research and provides technical assistance and professional development to states and school districts and has acted as the project coordinator and content expert in numerous intervention studies and offers technical assistance in the area of mathematics within tiered instruction. So with that, Nicole. Hello, so uh, I think I'm the first person who's uh, not going to be presenting research findings. I think what I bring to the table is more of the implementation angle. And now that I am no longer at my state technical assistance role, but I am actually in a district, um, these lessons learned are actually probably even more dramatic than I present to you today. So um, in these five years of math intervention pilot that occurred at middle school level, we had four middle schools and one upper elementary school, including two urban chronically underperforming schools. Our goal was to take the IES practice guide for mathematics response to intervention and implement it targeting first tier two. These were schools that did not previously have a tier two at all, and our goal was if we can get our tier two functioning well, we can take lessons learned to bring back into the core as well as then building our tier three for more intensive needs students. So I'll jump right to it so we don't have a lot of time. The, the first lesson learned um, included a problem of practice that I actually realize now is, is very common. You know, in the IES practice guide, it said by middle school, we really need to be focusing on an in-depth treatment of rational numbers, which makes perfect sense given our focus on preparation for algebra. Uh, unfortunately, we also tell people that they should look for the, you know, a diagnostic degree of what the children are lacking in their skill gaps, and what we were finding was all of the kids were lacking in-depth treatment of whole numbers. So here we are, kids in front of us, over 70 in one school site, and we don't know what we're supposed to do, rational numbers or whole numbers. Um, so in the end, in addition, I'd like to point out that there's a lot of political uh, pressure because of park and state testing, their perception um, that make them want to focus on the rational numbers and things that are closer to grade level standards with the goal of bumping um, kids that are right on the edge up in their park data. But this school, these pilot sites opted to start with the foundational gaps and that's where we went for better or for worse. So the next lesson learned, and this is based, again, not a controlled trial. This is basically looking at data that was how many students met by progress monitoring and screening our exit decision rules that they no longer needed intervention. What we found was that um, for students that did not have disabilities, and this is not just math disabilities, this is general disabilities, we found that the concrete representational abstract methodology with frequent practice and corrective feedback and all the things that we've discussed here today was effective at getting those students to exit. But what we found was students that had a disability and by middle school, 80% of the students that qualified for math intervention by our own defined entrance decision rules already had an IEP. 
Many of them did not have an IEP specifically for mathematics disabilities, but they were more global, reading, attention, autism, all across the board. So again, what we found was that um, explicit, systematic, actually direct instruction was most effective for students with disabilities. And the reason we used that approach wasn't a philosophical one. It was really an issue of personnel and training and you know, the ability to get by with what we had in the building for resources. Um, so here I also wanted to say this would be an interesting um, thing for there to be research on. I'd love to see further research and you can see what we have done with this lesson learned. In this lesson learned, the next thing that we did was we said, okay, so concrete representational abstract methodologies are working. They're working for students without disabilities. So we need to add those elements. And you can see here in our dark blue, this is our training sequence. We added trainings for all mathematical educators. So not just intervention, but general education. <coughs> We infused CRA um, instructional methods into our general education tier one approach, and we focused on integers, place value, multiplication, divisibility factors, and rational numbers. We figured we could prevent students from getting to the tier two level. The rest of the training on the left-hand side was for our math interventionists specifically. And if this training is of interest to you, you can see the web link at the bottom is a SOFIA tutorial. It's just a homemade screencast of the things that we did as five pilot sites. This is a training sequence. Oh, what this looked like in tiers, a tiered model, this is our sixth grade implementation at a particular school. Um, and you can see that at the general education level, we increased our use of concrete representational abstract methodology with supplemental approaches. We also used um, PALS, Peer Assisted Learning Strategies for Small Group Instruction for students who seemed to have um, more mild or on watch levels of need. They didn't seem to have as much need. And then for our, what we were calling tier two and tier three of more intensive, we ended up using again because of a resource issue and just surviving with what we had around for resources was SRA corrective math targeting multiplication and division on up at tier two and tier three targeting addition and subtraction on up. And it is important to note that all students got general education that had the you know, mathematical um, discussions and the heavy emphasis on the common core methods. And we did find that tier two and tier three, remembering that 80% of those students already had IEPs, that the um, addressing attention by having that constant call and response, core responding, as well as memory issues, by the way, uh, direct instruction sort of keeps circling back the same concepts, as well as removing a lot of language barriers was most effective in our model. Again, not a, not a controlled trial. So lesson learned number three. In the IES practice guide, it says motivation, motivational strategies you know, is, is recommended and has research, but what we found was behavior, motivation, and self-regulation are not just a recommendation, they are actually critical. Both teachers and um, students alike said that if that barrier was not removed, that they were, would be unlikely to be successful. And luckily in Rhode Island, we are a multi-tiered model, so we address behavior and social emotional aspects in the intervention. So what does that look like? First of all, in our training sequence, you can see all educators, because we actually merge them together in the very first training, get an overview of a mathematical full continuum. What does it look like? They also learn what do we know about struggling math learners? Um, learned helplessness, math anxiety, um, attribution theory, and, the, and the, um, the years of failure these kids have experienced. And we also learn how can we as teachers address these issues. Again, it's on the online tutorial if you would like to see it. From here, here's just one example. We teach, we teach the teachers that math anxiety is real, and that in fact, there's research that shows as young as kindergarten, students have learned math anxiety not only from their parents, but sometimes from their teachers themselves, and that we have to be careful not to model it. And in fact, we also teach the teachers, okay, here's a strategy. We're gonna teach you to embed in your math intervention positive self-talk. Um, this lesson plan and model was taken from writing, uh, SRSD writing uh, Dr. Leslie Loud, and we basically took her lesson plan and her graphic organizer, and we taught students to um, understand self-talk, and then we have a graphic organizer that as they're addressing math problems and, and um, situations where they're struggling, that they have positive self-talk, and the teacher models it and uses it regularly. They reflect on it in the end of class. In addition, if I had known we were gonna work so much on executive functioning, I took out this slide, we also teach the kids to engage with their own progress monitoring data, to set goals, to identify why they're growing, why they're not growing, and to really build their sense of self-efficacy and their growth mindset, because a lot of them just think they're just not math people. 
Okay, lesson learned number four, and this is what I'm supposed to get to as most importantly, and now that I'm in a district, I would like to say that intervention and special education isn't just, when, when these worlds collide, it's not just a hot mess, it's a hotter mess. It's a, it's a huge mess. And it, when, I, when I was at the state level and talking policy, it was easy for me to say that special ed is not a service, I mean, it's not a place or a person, it's a service, and that intervention is not a place or a person, it's a service. Well, in a building and in a district, this causes huge havoc. So if I can just illustrate. This is an example of entrance decision rules for one of our pilot schools, and I, you know, I know you can't read the details, but the bottom line is they're sorting kids, there's three gates, multiple data points to eliminate false positives, it's pretty complicated. So um, in their efforts, here were the hiccups that we hit globally. First, in screening all students, just the first step, um, we found that a lot of schools were not screening students with IEPs at all. It's double dipping, separate systems, they can't access it, et cetera. So making sure all students were included in the screening was important. Next, in IEPs, it's documented that standardized assessments have certain accommodations required. There was a lot of misunderstanding about if your screening tool says that accommodations are not permitted because it ruins the standardization of the assessment, that there, ha there might need to be a separate treatment of accommodations in state testing, standardized testing, versus accommodations in things like screening tools and when it's really needed. And so there was a lot of work around that, even at the district level. Next, so let's say we have grouped kids. Yes, we've screened kids with IEPs, and we have removed accommodations that are not needed to make sure that the data is solid. When we're trying to address intervention, the next issue that comes up is scheduling. By middle school, the only time that these students could receive intervention was also the only time they were addressing IEP goals. And their IEP goals were not aligned to the intervention systems in the building because these are two separate siloed systems. Um, and as a matter of fact, a lot of teachers didn't even think they could write IEP goals based on interventions that existed that were not run by themselves. So this might be a Rhode Island problem, I'm not sure. The next issue is by urgent intervention, so that's just tier two. By urgent intervention, tier three, some of you might even consider it tier four, question is, who's qualified to deliver? Special educators know a lot about disabilities. Math specialists know more about math. These kids have both disabilities and math struggles. Who is the right person? And in addition, most of these students prior to being part of this RTI system had previously received only one period a day of supplanted self-contained math instruction. So in many of our schools, gen ed kids in RTI were getting more quantity and quality of math instruction than special education students. And now that I'm in a district, it's a hotter mess than even a hot mess. It's, it, it gets worse. So these are really critical areas for research. I think it's really important that we talk about service delivery models, special education merging with intervention, and what is effective and efficient. So of course, lots of turf wars, and I don't, nobody was turf warring because they're malicious or not loving kids or education. Actually, it was a matter of nobody defined these things for them. You just had to define it. That was all, for better or for worse. So here's some examples of definitions that we created. There were many, but I don't have time for all of them. First, if the interventionist is saying, I will provide this intervention with fidelity, the special educator's role is to notify, like every other teacher, of the strengths and weaknesses of the child and necessary accommodations that are written in the IEP and to support the interventionist in making that happen. While the interventionist is, in the, is implementing the intervention and progress monitoring, he or she should be communicating regularly with special ed. With the help of computerized progress monitoring systems, special ed can, can check in anytime they want anyway. Special educators need to include in their IEPs screening and progress monitoring as part of their present levels of performance and include in their IEP goals and progress. When a student is not responding, this is where it would get a little extra messy, um, if, this, if, if the student with the IEP is not responded here on the left, the interventionist will communicate with the special educator and help plan the intensification with the special educator, although it's still technically owned by the interventionist at this point. And if more intensification is needed, so if the interventionist makes changes and the child still needs more, then it needs to be referred to the IEP team, and we just had to define that. And again, you could define it differently, but we just had to define it. And what does then the special educator do? The special educator is going to say, first, I communicate with the parents, because there's rules around that. Parents need to be engaged and a part of it, definitely by law at this point. 
And we also need to consider if, if there's any successful intensification that happens in math, the special educator should say, could that child benefit from that more broadly? Should I put it in their IEP? And then finally, if the child continues to struggle in intervention, we should say, is specially designed instruction needed? Do we need a math goal? And then, how do we ensure that special education, specially designed instruction truly is something more? So finally, um, extra good stuff to layer on here. At the end, besides in, 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 in RTI, I'm worried about screening and progress monitoring, and I have my, my proximal goals, with the distal goal being that state testing will also improve, because if schools are doing what's right, state testing should improve. Um, unfortunately, I have been disappointed by the park results. In schools where my five pilot schools, screening and progress monitoring data said our response to intervention model was pretty effective. Um, you know, we would say 50% of kids were exiting at the semester mark, which for middle school is great, is great outcomes. Um, but Park just wasn't impressive, and I, I cannot tell you why that is. Is it that general education is, is not changing their view of this child? There's still a child in the red. There's still a child who can't do it. Is, it. is it that we're not scaffolding enough for these kids in general education? Or is it that these are students that struggle with standardized tests like Park for a variety of reasons, and that maybe I'm not going to move the bar on that element. But as you can imagine, there's a lot of political pressure if I'm doing all this work for Park to move as well. Thank you. OK, thank you, Nicole. And we have Kat up next. <laughs> All right. So as Polly mentioned, we're going to be talking about our I3 project that Rebecca is the project director of. And really looking at this tier three, what does it look like actually in the elementary school? So we're going to start by reviewing our what the project entails. And then key elements of the data-based individualization approach, as well as lessons learned, and then have times for questions and discussion. So very similar, I know we've seen this triangle a couple of times. For this project, we were really focusing on those tier three students. And I'm saying tier three students, meaning students at risk, as well as those students already either in special education or part of that process already is happening with special ed. Um, mathematics was also a focus, as we've already heard. It's an area that's not as well researched. It's also an area that kind of scares schools to jump in and really start working on it. Um, you mentioned reading, they're like, we have a reading, we have the programs, we have curriculum, we're good. And we're like, okay, but what about your math? Yeah, the scores aren't there. Okay, so what are we going to do? And they're like, yeah, we don't know. And so that's why we really wanted to jump in and focus on mathematics within the multi tiered system of support. And the school we selected, um, they already had an MTSS plan. They were, they were doing it. It had some bumps and some, some things that needed tweaking, but it wasn't as fine-tuned in math, which is why that district got pulled in as well. Again, why are we focusing on intensive intervention? Because these are students that have persistently not performed. Um, I know Sharon Vaughn is a big one to say, it's not that they're not responding, they're not responding to what it is that we're providing. Um, or they're responding at a much slower pace than what we would expect. And so really looking at what does that intensification look like for those students most at risk. And this is the overview of the database individualization process. Again, this was from the National Center of Intensive Intervention. So if you'll see in the orange, we start with a tier two program. Progress monitoring, if we're not seeing those responses like we want, then we move into using the diagnostic data to adapt intervention, again, for those students most at risk in Tier 3. All right. See, that was my quick overview. We can get it done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, as Kat alluded to, part of why we wrote this particular grant was in our work with the, the National Center on Intensive Intervention, which I direct, we found that schools were very hesitant to engage in this work in, work in mathematics. They would take this on in reading and often in behavior and really be hesitant in math. So we were wanting to understand some of the implementation challenges of getting schools to do intensive intervention in mathematics for students who have those severe and persistent challenges. So the focus of our project was to not only help train or provide professional development to school interventionists in the mathematics content, but also to look at where they were starting through a, through a series of intake interviews, looking at their strengths and weaknesses within this broader MTSS or RTI system. 
We provided ongoing professional development and coaching based on those needs and also what we knew about the common areas of struggle that students who have intensive math learning needs exhibit. And then we also provided um, implementation checks on an annual basis, looking at how are things going, what are um, systems that are improving in the school and what are areas of need. And then we felt that that would move us toward more effective implementation of intensive intervention or that database individualization process, but we also have hypothesized, and this is an ongoing project, so we're still collecting data, but that we may see increased proficiency and efficiency of the MTSS system more broadly. So uh, many of you who work in this area may know the sort of common adage that, well, you have to work on the core first. You always have to do tier one. Well, I can tell you having worked with the National Center on Intensive Intervention now for six years, that schools will say that to you for five years and they'll still be working on the core and tier three or most intensive students will be languishing. And so our feeling was, it's, it's fine to want to work on the core, but we've got to get moving with tier three or intensive intervention as well. And our, our guess was that if you did that, you might see some positive impact in the broader MTSS system. So, and we believe in doing that that we could then improve outcomes for students with disabilities um, and who, uh, others who have intensive needs in math. So the content of the PD that we provided both focused on the assessment component of the database individualization process, so progress monitoring, why do you collect those data, what are they used for, once you figure out that a student is not making progress using those data, how do you use informal diagnostic assessment to dig deeper into the information that you have about the student to come up with a hypothesis about their learning needs, and then also an understanding of why we collect data for different purposes. We've worked in school districts where they collect as many as 34 assessments on children in any single year, and most of the teachers can't tell you why they collect one measure at a certain time and another measure at another time. So really trying to help them become more efficient in how they allocate resources for assessment. And then hand in hand with that, the mathematics intervention, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> professional development around mathematics content included both training and support around how to implement a standardized evidence-based tier two protocol, as, as we call them. So a, a manualized program that has evidence of effectiveness for students who are demonstrating um, some needs in mathematics. And then also, how then do we adapt those interventions when a student is not showing progress so that we can make them more intensive based on the student's needs? From, with that goal in mind, we took a series of, of um, mathematics um, common, uh, I'm sorry, not common core, but college and career ready standards and looked at the reasons that students with math learning needs often struggle with those standards and looked at the knowledge and content knowledge and skills that underlie those and created training and professional development modules to help teachers really understand the reasons that students struggle in those common areas such as fractions, number sense, place value, and so forth and how to then provide remediation to impact those areas in a way that provides, while it may not be the, the, the standards-based instruction that the student would be getting in the general education classroom, that it is aligned to the content that they're getting in the classroom and that it will reinforce and prepare students to be more successful in that general education environment. <clears throat> and then we also spent a lot of time both in our professional development and in our coaching thinking and supporting the district around the systems that surround a child with intensive math learning needs. And we have found that this is critical in making intensive intervention happen. Just providing professional development on math content is not enough. Let me say that again. Just providing professional development on math content is not enough. We have, um, in our work, learned many reasons that schools struggle to implement intensive intervention, and it often has to do not only with the knowledge and skills that teachers may lack related to mathematics content and assessment, but also how the um, MTSS system in the school functions more broadly, and how does it interface with special, special education, as Nicole alluded to, and then also the school and district supports the kind of messaging that they give around um, how intensive intervention should function within the school, whether there are time and resources allocated for data review and schedule adjustments and things um, based on student needs. And then finally, an, an attention to fidelity, follow through, and reteaching when needed. So for, I'm, uh, given our time, I'm only able to provide one example, but um, 
what we wanted to show here was, an, uh, was a student who was identified by the school as needing an intensive intervention. Um, and again, one thing to note about our project was we were providing <coughs> professional development to school teams about how to build structures that support students with intensive intervention needs. So it was, again, on them to identify the students they felt were most needy in their schools, and then also to design the interventions. So we provided some coaching and support, but they didn't necessarily, um, the choices they made aren't necessarily exactly what we would prescribe. But the reason I chose this particular example is I think it is a good example of a, an attempt to show um, multiple, excuse me, multiple rounds of changes to an intervention. So this conventional wisdom that, oh, if we can just pull a single manual off the shelf, we can fix kids who have math learning needs. You know, something that everyone in this room probably knows isn't true, but when you go into a lot of schools, they wanna say, well, well, what's the manual? What's the program we should buy? So the idea here is how do you help people kind of walk through that process for a student who's likely to need this kind of ongoing teach, test, teach, test approach to intervention. So we have a student who, after the fall screening, was identified as um, being tier three. Um, their, the first attempt at an intervention was to provide some additional practice for, with, with flashcards around, related to number identification. They found that just doing that alone, the student showed little or no growth. Then they made an instructional change, so the team met. They worked on providing more explicit instruction about one-to-one um, num num -one number correspondence and number identification up to five. They were doing this 40 minutes a week. They found again, their data showed little or no growth. The team came back together, looked at this again, and provided a, th a third change to the intervention, which, which was to increase uh, the, inter the intensity to a more frequent um, instructional period. Still, the student wasn't making enough growth. And then their fourth change was to move the student to an explicit instructional program. Um, and what we can see from this graph is that after that fourth change, we're starting to see some growth. While it seems like that it should be that the green dots are the corrects and the reds are the errors, it's actually the opposite. And what you can see, <laughs> and what you can see is that um, the student started with much higher rates of green and much lower rates of red, and very slowly we're starting to see that flip, okay? And, and again, I use this example not to say that we fixed this student's problem, but to show you the kind of perseverance that it really takes to make this kind of growth and instructional change happen. So we're starting to see a change for this student, but this is not the point at which we would then sit back and do nothing. The team is going to continue to reconvene, meet, look at the data, say, are we doing enough? What do we need to change? And then wh where do we go next? So this is this child that very likely is going to have a long career in some level of intensive intervention, when, whether it ends up being an IEP or a more um, just a, a focused intervention situation. So some words to the wise. In doing this work, we found you have to repeat yourself a lot, not just to the students, but to the adults. You, you may think that you have taught something but as Joe Jenkins once said to me as a master's student, just because you're throwing it doesn't mean they've caught it. So you often have to go back and say it again. You may have to go back and do it in the context of coaching, um, having them share their data, seeing the places where they've made errors and understanding what we as a, a set of um, support providers need to reteach and so forth. So see what I did there? You have to repeat yourself <laughs> a lot. You also have to explicitly address behavior and how it may manifest itself within academic domains. This has been something that has been a growing area of acknowledgement in our work with the center, that you cannot, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was just checking time. I know. I get, said, we just, didn't even just plan the this line. We planned it and it just aligned. <laughs> um, and so when you're, you're dealing with behavior in the, in, within those academic domains, it's, it becomes very critical um, to also think Think about the whole child when planning an intervention. Another example that we didn't have time to go into today was one where the child's having problems with fractions and the teacher says, well, I don't observe any behavior problems. And then when they go in and describe the student, they say falls asleep in class, puts their head down a lot, talks very quietly when they're um, in math group. And it took some explicit instruction to the teacher to say that is behavior. And it may not be throw, chair throwing and, and hitting or uh, dangerous behavior, but it is behavior that you do need to intervene on and think about how that impacts the student in the broader intervention plan, especially for kids at this tier three level. 
Um, as I said earlier, that hypothesis that we've had about in MTSS perhaps not needing to be linear, we've collected ongoing fidelity data looking at impl implementation both of intensive intervention and at MTSS more broadly in mathematics. And what we are finding is that, guess what? As one's getting better, the other one is too. And, and I can tell you that anecdotally also in the work that we're doing with the schools, that there are um, changes they've made to scheduling, assessment, how they plan intervention, that not only support tier three, but also have trickled down to other areas, or trickled up, you could say, to other um, components of the system. And then finally, fidelity matters. People don't do what you tell them to do all the time, even if you really want them to do it. They still may do, make choices that you wouldn't make. Um, and you, so you do have to learn to sit with that discomfort and, and really um, coach to shape behavior and not expect change to necessarily happen overnight. So with that, I think we will open it up for questions yeah. for the group. Great question. Great question. So we, um, in our support, we actually work with intervention teams and provide professional development in an ongoing basis to these teams. So that includes the school principal. Uh, this is a, school, a Title I district, but that has managed to allocate resources in a pretty impressive way where the, every building has a math interventionist, a building instructional coach, a special educator, school psychologist. And so all of those people sit on the intervention team, and they would be the ones that four students identified for this intensive intervention would be coming together and meeting on the student. And then based on the recommendations of the progress monitoring protocol, they would then um, make decisions about response in keeping with the, the recommendations of the protocol. So typically, that's you have about six to nine data points initially when you're taking data weekly before you can get a pretty comfortable estimate of your slope on your progress monitoring measure. And then from there, you can start to make some decisions about response to the instruction that is happening. And then once that particular time point happens, you can start making decisions um, with a little bit more frequency because you already have that slope that you're working from. And that, at that point, you use a trend line or the number of points below the, the um, the, uh, the goal line to make some of those decisions, or you can use a combined rule to, to make those adjustments. So typically that would be then a decision probably being made more like every four weeks or so. But again, there is some variability there. When you get into behavior, you may see decisions a lot more quickly. And part of the training, as we mentioned, we worked with the teachers, so we had them bring their data and try our best to use real data to teach them how to make some of these decisions. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the case studies. We had them highlight, and that was kind of you know, it made them nervous to have to share out in front of their peers, like, here's what we did. I mean, they even admitted they had a paraprofessional working with this student at the beginning, not sure about fidelity, not sure about correction procedures. And so have, we, we try to build that sense of community so that they could understand, as Rebecca said, we all kind of sat there uncomfortably sometimes, like, okay, but they may, I mean, that's what's really happening. And so trying to change and use that data so that they do make those decisions, um, and it's not false data. I mean, it's mm -hmm. the same way we want students to use real life, whether it's word problems. We had them bring their data and, okay, let's figure out when did you make this decision and had the whole group do a lot mm -hmm. of talking and sharing and asking each other questions that by the time they presented, you know, we had them slowly wor work up to bringing case studies. They were asking some of those mm -hmm. questions to each other instead of us always leading that. Oh, we solved it. 